Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, episode 10 of the Long Bangers podcast. I, I'm Matty. Uh, tonight, I'm joined by Brian again. Brian, how are you doing? No bad. No bad. Yourself? Uh, well, if I'm completely honest, I'm, oh, quite, no. I'm, I'm quite pissed off because... <laughs> We are doing up my daughter's bedroom now and we needed some bedroom furniture so I paid a joiner up front to make a couple of single beds and he's done a bunk. Oh, God. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay. Well, you're lucky because what you were going to get, I was going to tell you about the Indian restaurant that I went to. It was called Karma and it had any menus. You just got what you deserved. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you get these? Do you get them at Christmas crackers? Ah, uh, <laughs> you know what? Christmas crackers would be an upgrade. Um, <laughs> I just look. Uh, Winnie Henry. <laughs> oh, come on now, come on. <laughs> There's a. Uh, I just like uh, forty-one years of gathering. Crap. I can't remember important things, but I have a right ear for a crap joke. To be fair, talking of important things, uh, my missus dumped me earlier on today. Oh no. Uh, she. I mean, I like my music, as you know. I'm a big fan of my music, um, and she said she was going to leave me because of my obsession with the monkeys. And I thought she was joking at first. And then I saw her face. And you saw her face. Um, <laughs> I had a similar story to that one. Right? That joke's older than you, to be <laughs> fair. <so. laughs> my wife came in and told me off for singing Wonderwall. She said, would you stop that? I said, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> uh, right, you might have heard another voice uh, in amongst that. And we're joined tonight by... Uh, the runner of the Alternative Hibs uh, Twitter account, which is John Faulkner. Uh, John, you won, uh, or the lucky winner, lucky in inverted commas, uh, winner of our competition that we ran on Twitter uh, to join us on the podcast tonight. So uh, welcome, and how are you this evening? Uh, I am good, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, I've got the, the dubious honour, as you mentioned, of having been on uh, both uh, Hibs podcasts now, so it's uh, not quite the same accolade as uh, Louis Stevenson's, but uh, it's good to be here. That's close, though. Eh? He's got two cups, you've got two pods. Aye. That's all right. Aye. There's not many I, folk can say that. No, uh, your listeners will be pleased to hear that I've not got any of the shitty jokes that you two have. <laughs> <laughs> Aye, well, they probably will be, but what can you do? And this is, is a, a dubious honour joining us on here, but we do appreciate you giving up your evening uh, for it. Uh, it's always nice to have a an extra voice on. Um, I'm sure everybody will agree with that. They get sick of hearing me and Brian. <clears throat> yep. So uh, we'll, we'll get kicked off then with, with no hips game to talk about this week. That's so, <laughs> it's, uh, things are looking up already. We're already an improvement <laughs> on previous podcasts. There was a couple of Scotland games over the last few days. I think we all you really need to say them they were dreadful. Very little in the way. Hibs content. You had John McGinn played against Russia and got five minutes against Belgium. Meh. Uh, I, I don't think we need to waste too much time on Scotland. It was basically Hibs in blue, wasn't it? <laughs> I, I actually think they might have been worse. <laughs> well, actually, they were. Ah, uh, you're right. They um, they definitely got plenty of booze anyway. So there's a lot of the Hibs crowd there. <laughs> 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 we're all getting a call up to Hamden. <laughs> Hecky out. Hecky out. Um, so what we what we're looking at tonight is we we'll posed the question on uh, Twitter and uh, asked us to have a wee think about this. Uh, is look at uh, the situation at Hibs now. Say right. You're not allowed to just say sack the manager because that's the obvious one that everybody's kind of got their mind on. But what I'd like for, for both of you is to have a wee think about what one thing do you think is the, the key problem at Hibs? And if you were in charge, what would you do to fix it? So, uh, John, as you're the, the newcomer to the show, I think I'll give you the, the, um, the, the microphone to start off with. Just throw me in at the deep end, eh? Aye, that's how it works here. There's no mercy shown. This show knows no mercy. <laughs> Uh, so we're not allowed to say sack the manager? No, you're not, or not allowed. Or, or the head coach, as Lee tried to uh, get in on Twitter. Or Robbie Stockdale. Or Robbie Stockdale. Uh, well, to be honest, um, I was having a look at your uh, your Twitter feed the other day when you asked the question, and I think one thing that Hibs could do, or Hibs fans could do, is all start pulling in the same direction. Um, there's loads of people talking about different formations. I've seen 4-3-3, 3-5-2, 4-4-2 two mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen uh, Malberg being mentioned as the answer to our, our midfield problems. But maybe Which he definitely player. is. 
Right, but how, how can anyone say that? When I don't know. Um, also, from a, a sort of Hibs level, um, what you've got is, like, even just for example, Heckenbottom made a, a sort of declaration that there was going to be no more signings. It was a wee bit like Neville Chamberlain saying there would be peace in our time. Because then after that, you've got Middleton and Malberg come in. And I appreciate, obviously, with uh, the Middleton signing, um, it was maybe for... Uh, Martin Boyle with him being injured unexpectedly yeah. he did say at the time um, unless circumstances change there's going to be no more signings but then where did Malberg come from and I think that's created a wee bit of element sorry it's created a bit of confusion amongst the Hibs support because they're getting mixed messages and who's actually in charge of the messages who's actually in charge of the signings so a wee bit of Hibs all pulling in the same direction would probably probably pay dividends in my opinion bit of consistency with the messages etc Aye. I think that's a fair point. Um, Malberg, I know, um, for, for you know things that you hear down through the grapevine, we were definitely after him early on in the transfer window. He was on on the radar for a long time, so he wasn't a like a panic signing that came in at the last minute. We yeah. were at him, and I think he meant, he mentioned it in um, in one of his interviews that it almost happened a couple of months or however long it was before. Um, so he'd obviously been one that they would be wanting to get in. But you're absolutely right. I can't imagine Heckenbottom doesn't know that that's happening. You know that we've got a chance of doing it. So to throw out, we're getting no more signings, and what that did was it got everybody in a bit of a tiz because I think everybody could see we still needed uh, work to be done on the pitch. But uh, uh, what do you think of the comms in general for Hibs at the moment? Uh, to be honest, I've not really been following the, the official Hibs account that much when I've been, because I've been pissing about with my alternative Hibs account. Um, the one thing that I mainly look at from uh, the Hibs official uh, account is uh, just when the, the squad's coming out on match day, um, yeah. usually around about two o'clock. Um, for a while there, um, Hibs and the interaction with the fans was really, really good. And I think the last thing that I saw they had recently was uh, when they had the, there was the three competition winners. I think someone had their... Uh, season ticket paid off. Yeah. Someone won a again the dubious honour of winning a free pie. Um, maybe they'll try to poison them and get rid of them. <laughs> uh, but I, I mean, the Hibs, Hibs communication in the past have been really good. It's maybe taken a wee bit of dip recently, but then that could be part and parcel of um, Ron Gordon coming in and reviewing things. Like it might pick up again in the future. Um, oh. I think Kenny Miller that works there, he does a really good job. Um, at getting stuff across and he does engage with fans especially when there's been a bit of criticism coming their way I noticed that he posted on uh, Hibs.net uh, through the week to say that they're, they're expecting to have more content coming out so they've just finished on a I think effectively what's a studio um, for producing stuff out at East Mains which allows them access to the players and they can get their stuff edited and put out quite quick so I think Hibs are very much aware that they need to be doing more to connect the players and the, the, the fans at the moment. Um, so I think probably the thing that you've highlighted, John, is, is probably something that the club have also identified as an area for uh, for improvement. What about you, Brian? Uh, well, in, in terms of the comm side, um, I think there definitely has to be an improvement. Um, marathon bet were, were actually really good. Um, when they were our sponsors in terms of the content you had the oh, what was it called the Fon, Fon- Fontaine of Truth Fontaine, Fontaine of Knowledge, Knowledge. that Aye. was it just wee bits like that it, it just showed a different side to Hibs um, behind the scenes and I think it's interesting to see the amount of vacancies that have come up um, for, for Hibs I think the market and the creative side etc whether Ron Gordon's come in or his, his little agent that he's put in there, um, his eyes and ears, who's looked and says, no, we need to do this, we really need to beef this up. Um, I think what John says, absolutely. Everybody pulling in the right direction because we have kind of, I don't know, there's there's a bit of malaise has crept in. It's, it's apathy almost is, is kicking in, which is, that's the worst thing you can have um, when the apathy kicks in. In terms of where I think we went wrong, going back to the the, the original yeah. question, um, I obviously I can't see sacking the manager, so I'll go the opposite way and we'll see if we're backing the manager. Get your strongest living, keep it, stick with it, find it, 
and stick with it. I'm all for horses for courses, and sometimes you need to go one up front, sometimes you need to go two up front, and whatever, etc. But that game against St Johnston showed to me and everybody else he, he didn't know what to do. Yeah, that's why Alan was played wide right. It's, it's how can I have a two up front but still play Scott Allen and no drop Stevie Allen. Just find your best. Whether you need to find the best formation and then you put the players in there or you get your best players and you get a formation to suit them. Either or, find it and stick with it. And I hope that's what he's done over the, the, the last week or so with the international break. He's, he's worked to this is This is the way forward. Um, I think if you look at, look at Neil Lennon back in uh, January last year, mm-hmm. we sold Stokes, we sold Murray, who was, was scoring goals. Or had been scoring they were goals. top scorers, yeah. Top scorers out the door, brought they to um, Camberry and McLaren, and Scott Allen, boom, off we went. And it was barring injuries, I think we pretty much had the same start in 11, week in, week out. And yeah. that was arguably the best uh, five, six months of following Hibs we've had for a long, long, long time. I just hope, I hope for Heckin, but I mean, as much as I'm on his back, I hope for his sake and for us sake, because he's, these players have been brought in under under his his um, management. I hope he gets it right. He made um, a comment after uh, the Motherwell game, I think, which is, and it's, I'll paraphrase because I can't remember exactly what he said. But he said, we know what the problem is and you'll see us address it in January. Yeah. Now, that, that, again, that provoked a little bit of uproar because you're thinking, uh, after the Motherwell game, we're still in the transfer window, we're still trying to fix it now. Mm-hmm. But do you think it's reasonable for a, a a head coach or a manager, whatever you want to call him, um, head coach, I'll, I'll show him the respect again of the right job title, um, to say... Right, I want to bring in nine players this window, which is a lot, with a view to bringing in an extra couple in January to fill it up, because bringing in a whole new team now is too much in one go. I wonder um, how many of the signings we made are solely his signings, and how many are, are the the recruitment departments. Um, Halberg, for me, is somebody that would be identified by the recruitment department. Are they then pushing the envelope and saying, you're getting him? It's either him or nobody. Is that a message maybe coming from above? The likes of Joe Newell, Tom James, etc. The, the guys for down south, I can understand, would be heck and bottom. Dodge, for example, there's obviously a, a crossover as well. I know Dodge was on the recruitment team's list as it was. Yeah. And Heckenbottom mentioned him. So that was a no brainer in a sense. They're both singing for the same song sheet. But I wonder how many of the signings are recruitment department against Heckenbottoms. Um bit of a strange one, what you see him saying with the window still open, you'll see in January what I'm after. Um or or what we need to do to address it. That's a wee bit weird. But well, do you think it's a case of waiting for the right player? So you maybe the, you maybe go, right, I want this boy at this club. He's not available now, but I know in January his position is going to change. Situational change is going to become available then. Is it worth keeping your powder dry, no spending money on somebody you've not got a long-term plan for, and waiting for that player to come available? Mm, possibly. But then why not he himself kind of made a rod for his back by saying he's, he's, he's a big fan of the of bringing in players on loan. So... It's true. The one that we really want isn't available till January. Or we think we can maybe get him cheaper in January because we know he's not going to play between you know August and January. Bring in somebody on a six month loan, a twelve month loan, or, or is it just because we've got no money? Is he telling the truth? He told me to my face. It wasn't. Well, he never said we have got no money, but he said it's it's not my money. Aye. I don't know. What are your thoughts on it, John? Uh, I don't know. Like, I, I, I sound a wee bit like a broken record sometimes when people talk about signings because I do distinctly remember, um, I can't remember if it was Evening News or Scotsman or one of the newspapers where Heckenbottom said that he wasn't in charge of all the signings. 
um, that obviously Hibs and the recruitment team and whatever, they all sort of sit together and they work something out. Um, but he definitely said that he wasn't in charge of everything. So, I've, I mean, that, what I was saying before about Hibs pulling in the same direction, like who is actually signing the, the players? Who has the final say? Um, because a lot of people point the finger at um, Heckenbottom and say, these are your signings, these are your players, these guys are on the bench and you don't trust them. So you've made an asset in the first couple of months of the season. Where does the you know where does the buck really stop? Because I, I don't know if it's really fair just to sort of point a heck and bottom and say right you you signed a bunch of a bunch of huddies because there's other guys behind the scenes that are working to bring players in as well, and they seem to be almost immune from criticism. Yeah, it's a good point. the The message we got so we did a tour of the uh, East Mains. I mentioned this before and saw I spent a good bit of time with the recruitment team and they showed a bit of uh, insight into what sort of things they looked for. Um, how they source players, but the message from everybody was really consistent. The sign off goes by the head coach. That's right. it. So it's no, it's no George Craig, it's no Graham Matthew, it's no Leanne Dempster that's going to say this player is right for your team. The head coach will look at the players that are, that are available for him and say that's the one that I want. Go and try and get them, and if they can't get them, they'll have a second choice and a third choice uh, to to go after. But that was the message. It was totally consistent. Now, whether that's... Is that maybe a list, though, that the recruitment team saved? Uh, this is all hypothetical. Hickenbottom says, I want a, a right-back. Mm-hmm. Um, and the re- recruitment team then provide him with a list of five right-backs and they say, right, you can only choose for that list. I think what um, what happens, and again, this is how my interpretation of what they were saying, is in that situation, the recruitment team will have ready to go a list of players that are within budget that uh, might become available that fit the profile that you're looking for for a right back. Mm-hmm. So based on any number of factors, like, you know, are you wanting a, a right back that bombs up and down? Are you wanting one that's hard in the tackle, that blocks crosses, can, you know, play with the ball at his feet, wh- whatever it is that you're looking for that will fit the profile of a right back at Hibs. So you have a consistency that, you know, if the manager goes, you know, having to redo the team all the time. Um, so, you have you have that, um, and then the manager can also give input. So the recruitment team will say, here's uh, here's our list of players. The manager can say, well, I want Tom James at that club. Can you add him and see if he'd be available? And then the recruitment team go and do what they can to to make that happen. So I think it's like a, 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 a proper team effort. I think they, yeah. uh, they all go for it. Um, so I, I don't know. Like if you're talking about where the where the buck stops, I think you you kind of have to say it's the the head coach. I don't think you've got any any other alternative but to say it's the it's the head coach that's, uh, uh, that's and, responsible uh, ultimately for it. I, I know when he arrived, he, he presented um, Hibs with a list. So it's like I say, did he put the two of them together? Did he say, oh? You know, it's like when you're swapping panini stickers, got that, got that logo. <laughs> you know, what's? I don't know. I don't know how it's how it, how it's how they arrive where they've arrived at. Um, you just you hope. Going back to to what John said as well, um, in terms of fixing things, everybody pulling in the right direction. You hope that the the recruitment department and the head coach are singing for the same song sheet as much as the fans and the club itself um, were all pulling forward in the same direction. But I would think they would have to be because I think if you had a situation where they weren't there, that's untenable. You can't... If if you didn't trust the head coach to make signings, you shouldn't be your head coach. You, you, I, you know, you, yeah, you, you're yeah. in and you say, okay, well, you, thanks, thanks for trying. You're not for us and we'll get the next guy in. And the same with the recruitment yep. team. If they're not on the same page as the manager, maybe it's cheaper to replace the recruitment team and you go and try and find somebody who's more aligned. But... I don't think you can have a situation where they're no totally in unison with what they're looking for. I, I do agree with that. What, what maybe flies in the face of it, if you like, and it's not just Hibs, there's, there's plenty of other teams. And by Hibs themselves specifically have came out and said it's for too long, you kind of, you'd have someone coming in, a manager's maybe got a shelf life of, what, say, three, four years, yeah. team, possibly less. So how, how could you possibly, you know, it would be, business suicide to give them full control of everything of knowing that they're not going to be here yep. then that's why they changed the model when you've got your head coach before you had your manager assistant manager a first team coach and pretty much depending on how rich you were you'd have other coaches now it's 
you've got your head coach who's answerable to a, a director of football or a director of operations who's answerable to the board and then you've got your recruitment teams etc and your analysts and whatnot. so it's as opposed to divvying up the responsibilities um, of the day to day operations of a club but is it then diluting that that control over the signings, over the, the training, when you've got so many people with their fingers in the pie? That's a good question, because I, I suppose that they get to a point where if you're signing players by committee, somebody's not going to be happy. It's very very rare that you get a unanimous agreement on oh. anything. You, know, Did, but you imagine if, that you're working, if you work certainly like by work, you, you'll go in and you'll have four people at five will say we should do X, and then the fifth person will say, no, I think we should do Y. Aye, aye. I mean, could, could Paul Hickenbottom identify a, a, a cracking midfielder and say, he's terrific, we need to get him on a four-year contract? Has George Craig or Leanne Dempster or someone else got to say, well, hold on a minute, your contract runs out in two years' time, so we're not going to give him four years because the next guy might come in and no fancy him. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate here, don't get me wrong, but... No, I think it's a good question because when you think back to pre-Dempster, say when Rod Petrie was still in charge, uh, I presume, in charge of the hirings and firings when we went through, uh, who did we go through? Um, after Collins, you had... Uh, God, here we go. Lyon, <laughs> then Hughes, then... Fenwin. Calderwood. Fenwin Cal- Calderwood. Butcher. So you had guys that came in that had... A wee I've, got, uh, I've got the book now, by the way. I've just gone through <laughs> that list. What have you done to me? <laughs> so when you go through that list, I think everyone there had about, what, roughly 18 months, say? So they had the tail end of someone else's season um, yep. and they had started their own season again. I'm curious to know how much it actually cost Hibs to get rid of all those players because of that short-term thinking. Oh, I, oh it, it was must ridiculous. Have been bombs. Yeah. Must have been fortunes, um, which would have obviously it must have had an impact on the, the the ability for Hibs to sign players for them to pay better wages for players that they maybe would have missed out on otherwise. Well, he, here's uh, maybe another another thing to throw into the mix, then, Brian, because you, you, I totally agree with your point there, John, and I agree with the point that you made, Brian, about right, here we've got a manager last in two years, but we're giving players four years on their contract. And the two years isn't going to be being disrespectful uh, to the hecking bottom, but history tells us that's about how long a Hibs manager gets. Mm-hmm. You look at the side that won the Cup, and that was a side that uh, didn't start off on fire. You know, didn't they get promoted and they had some shocking results all the way through. There wasn't like they were scintillating performances every week. But over time, and we've still got the, the, the core of that team. You've still got like David Gray, your Lewis Stevenson, Hanlon, McGregor, um, and so on, uh, Martin Boyle. The, the, mm-hmm. the, the nucleus of the team. And because we, if you look at the, the evolution of that side from Stubbs uh, to Lennon, it was wee changes. Wee changes, it was like a player here, a player there, a wee bit at a time. And you had that consistency because you had the players in for a number of years. So it's maybe a secular thing um, that, that we've got back to the point where, right, that cycle from uh, Stubbs era through Lennon has come back in the natural end. You're looking at players that are, are ready to kind of move on to the other things in their career. And you need to start that journey again. So you put the foundation down and maybe these players that aren't quite cutting at the now are going to form the basis of a good hip side <coughs> over a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Pat? Yep. Maybe I'm talking shit. No. <laughs> but aye, there's a there's a, a line of thinking there that if, if you're given long contracts to players, two, two things that you're thinking if you're getting a long contract is you're either going to have them as the backbone of your team or you're going to sell them at a premium because you think they're good enough to, to outgrow you. Aye. There's no other reason to get him four years. Yep, hundred percent, a hundred percent. Hi, right. Uh, if you were making a tactical change, so maybe a change to the personnel or uh, or formation, what would you do? That's open to whoever wants to answer it first. Uh, drop Malin. Aye, aye, and it, it's nothing. It's nothing personal against Malin. Um, I think when we talk about, I say, I say we. Uh, when you see people talking about formations. Um, I don't think people appreciate that in order to play one formation, you need to give up something else somewhere. So you play 
three five two, for example, you're going to miss something. If you play four four two, you're going to miss out on something. If you play four five one, you're going to be missing out on something. Um, and it doesn't seem like from the thing, the the stuff that I read anyway, it doesn't seem like many people are prepared to make a sacrifice anywhere. Yeah, uh, especially because one of the the sort of cornerstones, if you like, of the upside is getting Malin, uh, not Malin, sorry, getting Squall Allen playing in his so-called natural position, number 10, just behind the strikers. Yeah. That in itself creates a bit of a problem because it almost feels like, I think Hibs have maybe had this difficulty before, where they've tried to play all of their best players without actually trying to have the best team on the park. Uh-huh. It has to give. And at the moment, I think based on some of his recent performances, it's uh, Stevie Mallon. Um, the guys on Hibs Talk had said that he would be a difficult player to drop. Um, because he was Hibs uh, player of the season last year. Um, but you only get to ride it out for so long. And at the moment, I think he's I think he's at the end of that. Maybe he needs to be dropped. I would agree with that. So, so Marlon, for me, I, I feel like a pick on Stevie Marlon. I don't know, didn't he? But Marlon, out of, out of that team, if you were to hang your hat on somebody having your back and being able to dig out a hole, it's no Stevie Marlon. There's, there's pretty much every other player on the pitch you're going to get more value from for longer in a game than, than you get from Allen. And uh, I think that you've got a... So for me, I think that the biggest issue is the midfield and protect the back four. Mm-hmm. So yep. sacrifice Marlon, put somebody that can put a tackle in there and then have a have a really good go at it. But uh, yep. I, it's, uh, it's, I suppose it's easy for our point of view when you're not responsible for having to go and make that change and, and pick which player you're dropping but I think what John was saying about Malin being the player of the year making it hard to drop him and maybe it does make it hard to drop him but that's what your manager's got to make difficult decisions at the end of the day so if, if you drop your player of the year you drop him if it's for the good of the team I aye, aye, uh, totally and I think if I look at Stevie Malin where's Stevie Malin's where do, where do I see Stevie Mallon being at his best for, for Hibs? Probably behind a front two. Unfortunately, Scott Allen is that's his best position in my eyes. And Scott Allen over Stevie Mallon every day of the week for me. Aye. And I, I like Stevie Mallon, I do. But I think if you're looking at like one tactical change or whatnot, I'd absolutely 100% a defensive midfielder is, is what's missing. Um, but I, I, I'd be looking... If I was Paul Heckenbottom, I'd be thinking, right, who's my best players? Who's my most effective players? Scott Allen, absolutely, 100%. Plays best behind a front two. Phil Canberry, arguably a second best player. In my eyes, yeah. a, a, a second best player. What's his best position? What's Where is he most effective? To me, it's in a two. I've tried him out wide on the left. He's no bad. He's, he's, he's all right. Tried him up front by his cell. No bad. All right. Camberry for me plays best in a two. Yeah. So, in my head, there you're, I'm thinking straight away, Allen behind the front two, there's Camberry and Dodge. You, you then kind of play that. Unless he wants to have the ball wide and we, we attack the flanks and we're, we're, we're direct in that regard, which is kind of much what he touched on, um, then you can maybe go a diamond. But, for me, and at Heckenbottom himself, there was somebody that's I don't know where it was, I'd read it. Somebody had said Hickenbottom specifically told the players we're not doing three at the back or five at the back. That's just no affirmation he went attain. But if you want to get the best out of Scott Allen and you want to get the best out of Canberry, maybe that's what he needs to look at. Hi. Um, but then again, that's I'll, I'll go back to, I think, the first podcast I was on. That's me essentially overcomplicating things. Just fucking put a team out and win a game. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Quite simply. <laughs> it's not that hard. It can be. Can it be? Uh, it sounds simple, eh? When you say it like that, just uh, Aye, just go out and win. <laughs> just go play play the, play the bloody game. Go out and win. Davy is are good at. Just uh, the old Kevin Keegan. He used to just. We used to do this in James's Park. He would just sit five minutes before a game. Steve Heavies told the story and said that there was no tactics, nothing. He just, he'd just go out and enjoy yourself, entertain the fans. Aye. That's what you need. Definitely could do a bit of entertainment, eh? 
Oh, God, I absolutely. Right, that probably is a good uh, a good opportunity to segue into uh, Hibs ladies because they are uh, significantly more entertaining at the, at the moment than the, the men's side, much more uh, successful as well. Uh, they are playing Slavia Prague Champions League tomorrow night. Uh, it's ten pounds uh, or three pounds entry at the door. The Easter Road quarter to eight kick off. Uh, have you seen much of the ladies team? No, I must admit, no. Well, the game's on. If you can't make it down Easter Road, the game's on BBC Alapa. I said that properly as well because uh, well some, somebody corrected well me last time. Hi, ah, thanks. Uh, that's me. I'm officially claiming myself as uh, bilingual now, <laughs> uh, which I think means I can use pretty much any toilet I want. Um, <laughs> I actually had a mate who uh, <coughs> fell in love with rucksacks. He was by Satchel. Oh dear. Okay. Uh, <laughs> anyway, BBC Alpha, they, they're, they're showing the game, so if you, <laughs> if you can't get down to the game, uh, and I, 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 would, I would hope they get a good crowd because they definitely deserve it. Uh, they play Slavia Prague, watch it on BBC Alpha or get, get down to the stadium and get them support because they definitely deserve it. Um, Do you know if they get the Champions League music? Because there'll be a novelty factory going east the road to hear that. That's a good shout. Uh, I have no idea. Maybe somebody listening can uh, can let us know, or somebody who goes tomorrow can come and report back. Uh, right, that's that's decent. It would be good to hear that Easter Road. Aye. I wonder if we request that. You know how uh, the the Hibs announcer is on Twitter, and he's <laughs> sure he's keen for a request. We should just just request that. Just the absolute can bombard. You, can, <laughs> if we did, everybody just tweet the Hibs announcer to say you want to play the Champions League music uh, before our next game at home. Uh, which is against Hearts, so that'll be even more banter uh, for them. <laughs> we'll no doubt they go on to lose it, and it'll be known as the Champions League derby instead of the P45 derby that's getting called at the moment. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, another game that's happening this week is a charity football match with Hibs Legends uh, on Sunday at Orium. Uh, doors are at 12 o'clock, £5 on the door, £2 if you're a kid. And it's HSBC stroke Capco. Initially, when I read that, I read it as Capcom. You know, the video games folk, and I was thinking, oh, you have Zangrief and Chun Li and, oh, uh, and Ed, 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 Eddie Honda and that playing Hibs Legends, which would be an interesting if one sided game. Um, on the Hibs team, the list of names that I saw had uh, Gordon Hunter, Darren Dodds, Mark McGraw, probably stretching legend a wee bit here, uh, Gareth Evans, Stephen Tweed. Uh, we fact famous Stephen Tweed, he's the wife's cousin. Um, Lee Bailey and Stuart Noble. Stuart Noble was probably the only name out there that I didn't recognise. You remember, remember Stuart, Stuart Noble playing for the Hibs? No. 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 To be fair, when did Lee Bailey play for the Hibs? I think I remember See, seeing Lee Bailey play for Livingston against a Hibs 11 when I was about 16, 17. I think um, he was a youth player, was. Were they? Aye. I'm sure he does coaching in Dunfermline now. I might have that completely wrong, but I seem to remember. Or he's a driving instructor or something like that. I know some fact about Lee <laughs> Bailey, which I can't quite remember accurately at the moment, so I'm going to leave that one right there. <laughs> you can fill in the re- blank. Make, a, make it whatever you want. If you can't remember it, does that make it an alternative fact? <laughs> Aye, have that one. You can tweet it. You can, it's like the Brian Graham ones. <laughs> Lee Bailey something something alternative fact. <laughs> Aye. So, uh, Lee Bailey, if you're listening to that, I'm sorry for uh, not knowing your post-football career uh, choices. That's my bad. I bet you Raiden would be good at diving heaters. Aye. Who is the Indian guy with the stretchy legs? So, was that no Zang? Balsam. Bal- Sim. Bal- Sim, aye, because Zangriff was a Russian boy, wasn't he? Aye. And then... Uh, was he not the... playing up front for Russia the other night? <laughs> <laughs> There's no like a boy called Tossoff or something. I think if that's a, it was something like that. But now I feel like I'm racist. You've been for, told about watching those channels, Matthew, uh, for, <laughs> for making that comment. But I'm sure there was like one of these kind of mildly amusing names, like Kuntz for Germany. Um, oh, aye. Aye. Oh, was there not a, a Fuchs or a Fux? F U C H S. Yeah, yeah. I forget who he played for. He was German. Oh, Christian. Christian. Christian Fuchs. Fuchs. Christian Fuchs. Christian Fuchs. <laughs> Jeez, oh. Do, do we know if he was ever on the same side? Just of offended an entire religion there. Okay. <laughs> Aye, I don't even care how do we get that. So I, I, when we started this tonight, I did not expect us to be talking Street Fighter Two and uh, Fox and Cunts uh, in there. Wu Kang for an overhead kick. Aye. Mm-hmm. Who was so, the uh, electric boy, Balrog or something, wasn't it? Oh, the Brazilian. Aye. See, he's bound to be good. You'd want a Brazilian on your side. 
You wouldn't know why I'm marking To be fair, I've got enough money as it is. Uh, well, the Brazilian, he's great through the middle, but the rubbish either side. <laughs> There's nothing there. <laughs> right. Uh, so, I think we can move on. That's, I've done my announcements for, uh, for that. So, go, and, go along and see the Hibs ladies. And then, if, uh, if you're no second by uh, Hibs after the weekend, then go along and see the Hibs legends at the Orium uh, as well. That was uh, Mark Cochran sent me that one and asked me to do it. Mark Cochran also pointed out that uh, he used to work beside me at McDonald's back in the day and didn't think I remembered, but I do remember. Uh, so hello, Mark, if you're listening. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> we forgot to cover this last week to our uh, eternal shame. And I'm not, I, I say eternal shame. Uh, would make it sound like we have some pride in what we do here. Um but our right midfielder in our team for the, for the 2010. So I'm going to ask you both to, to pick a right midfielder. Uh, Brian, I'm going to get you to start because I think we've just momentarily lost uh, John for the conversation. Um, so a right midfielder for our team from post-2010. Uh, oh. hmm. 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 It's going to have to be Martin Boyle for me with a notable... Honourable mention to a Mr. William Henderson. Oh, do you know what? It's funny when we were talking about it, and Liam Henderson didn't even come into uh, into my thinking. Aye, I just thought of him just now. I don't think he's probably. Well, I was going to say he's not done enough to be. What we've gone for two thousand ten, the last nine years. But then again, he probably he, he done more in fifteen minutes Aye. than at all. Oh, no, Martin Boyle. I'll stick with Boyle. I'll stick with yes, Boyle. What about you, John? So we, uh, I think you, you dropped out for a wee moment there. We were oh. talking about a right midfield. Um, Brian's gone for Martin Boyle with a, an honourable mention for uh, Liam Henderson. Uh, well, I suppose it depends how funny or controversial you want me to be. If you want me to be serious for a second, then Boyle's probably um, because he's just much, much better than Sproul. As much as Sproul had his hat trick and what have you, Boyle was just a better footballer. Yeah. Uh, but I was frantically scribbling the names sort of throughout the the opening section of the podcast, and I came up with Paul Hartley and uh, Jarko Viss. <laughs> oh, I. Uh, I, I think they think they disqualified for no being post twenty ten. Oh, that's a good point. So uh, you can scratch out Paul Hartley then. Sorry, see, this is where I went wrong when I was scribbling down all these names. I'm, I'm just going to, just for the avoidance of doubt, that's not the only reason I'm scoring him out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, do you know, I actually, I can't remember most players post-2010, which is terrible. Um, I think my, my, my sorry, all-time Hibs 11 is just stalled on uh, the cup winning team. 2016, it's hard to see yeah. past that, isn't it? Hard hmm. to see Hard to see after it. Uh, hi, Martin Boyle is probably who I would pick. What about Scott Allen? <laughs> well, I <laughs> suggested that. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> but we're sick. Uh, we, we, we're happy with Martin Boyle. Aye, aye, aye. aye. I think I think he deserves. It. I would feel uh, like I, it was hard done to if we'd left him out. Aye, because he's a. Uh, He's been a, a cracking player for us. And he's, I think, like with Evan McGregor, though, I think we could put Henderson on the bench. Aye, but we have to really, because you're wanting that, you, know, you don't know what position you're going to be in going into injury time in the game. And yep. so you might need to bring him on in case, just on the off chance you get a corner. Right, so mm-hmm. to summarise the team so far, if I remember it off the top of my head, we had uh, Rocky and goals. Rocky, David Gray, Oris Stevenson. Bamba. Then we've got the uh, we've got Bamba and Big Effie. How did Bamba make it in there? <laughs> Who decided that? I think we did it for just if you imagine having the two centre halves and your two centre halves being the most heart in your mouth, head in your hands, fingers over your eyes uh, moments for a centre half. Bamba and Ambrose. Both absolutely maverick, but both absolutely terrific. Because that was how they got in. It was too easy to go for. Um, Hamlin and McGregor uh, if you wanted to fit Fontaine there if you want to go back to, to the cup team they were the obvious ones but just for shits and giggles Bamba and Ambrose is yeah, they got the nod and now uh, we've got Boyle so we'll look uh, next time at the left midfield and I'll I'll try and get a list out of uh, eligible players for it this time I've been pretty lazy in doing this there's quite a bit of research to try and 
work out who's played in right midfield. Mm, absolutely. Josh did it for the goalkeepers for us, and he put the list out. That was easy. He could just go through the list, and there were some shockers on there. Some folk you didn't recognise. Jacob Divis. Jacob Divis, <laughs> aye. Oh, geez, oh. Um So I'll, I'll maybe ask, uh, ask Josh to go and do my list of left midfielders, and we'll, we'll do that next time. Um, OK, moving on then. So, Duncan Dares. Duncan Dares, we had... Uh, this is where you get to nominate somebody associated with Hearts, or otherwise known as a Duncan, uh, to do something ridiculous. And I was thinking earlier on that I would nominate um, Nanny McPhee. Uh, now, he is a set-piece master technician. Uh, ta- technician? A, ta- <laughs> a, a tactician. I don't even know what a technician is. If it, maybe that's what um, Lee Bailey does now. He's a tactician. The tactician uh, for the set pieces is Nanny McPhee, so I'm giving him the credit rather than Levine for uh, shelling the ball into touch for a line out at the cup final. So my dare for him is to then take that a step further and design a set piece which involves one or probably two people having to lift up Big Uche to win a header that's higher than everybody else for either a corner kick or a throw in. <laughs> Who do you reckon was heavier? Uh, Uchi or um, what's his chops? Nadi. Um, Nadi, aye. I could have oh, forget him. Nad- Nadi was twice the player that Uchi is. <laughs> Un- unbelievable that he scored uh, so many goals against us because he was one of the worst players ever. And for some reason, we just shat it whenever we played him. Uh, yep. He was terrible. There's a, a, an amazing thread, and I think uh, it will sound big headed to me, but I started it, uh, which was. Just something along the lines of just wanted to say Christian Nadi is pish. And I don't know if uh, Brian, I remember if you remember, that. And what happened yep. is you had uh, loads of then it turned into film quotes that were adapted to highlight just how pish Christian Nadi was. So for for instance, you had the, the wee boy for the sixth sense saying, "I see pish people." <laughs> <laughs> But the, the thread, I think it's in the vault on, on him, isn't it? But, I was uh, just about to ask that. I hope it is. I'm sure all the pictures are not, like a good chunk of the pictures are, are no longer kind of sourced where they were originally on the internet. So you have like files missing. It's not quite as funny as it, <laughs> as it once was. But there was some absolute, uh, absolute genius things on that. Oh, there was. I remember that now. That was brilliant. As was, by the way, when we were talking about the uh, the ball getting shelled out for the line out in the, the cup final, the thread about what that cup final DVD would be called for the hearts. So, Brian, I think your one made me laugh the most, which was uh, one flew over the entire midfield. I thought that was super. The best one I could come up with was, was uh, Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> what about um, Das Boot? <laughs> das Boot. <laughs> ah, quality. Um, if anybody thinks of anything, any other film titles, send them into us on, on the Twitter at Long Bangers. Um, and we will, I say we'll read them out next time. I'll not read them out. I'll go with the best intentions of reading them out and then uh, then forget. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is how shambolic this is. Um, right, so do, do either of you have a Duncan Dares to, to contribute? I kind of put you on the spot because then they ask you to prepare this. Aye. Uh, so I was from Winston Elston at the same time as I was getting players pre-2010. Um, so what about Phil Stack and he needs to eat himself at a swimming pool of chicken nuggets? <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll take that one. Just wow. <laughs> I don't know if anybody will top the Wayne Rooney one. The Wayne Rooney and Budge one, that, that was probably the most... Bizarre one that we had so far. What was no? What was the other one? And was it? Oh, I agree. Some, Pushing on somebody. I, to say I actually, like Gary Locke, wasn't it? Oh, that was about a wild one, wasn't it? That was a story. That wasn't just a, a Duncan Dale. That was an essay. <laughs> <laughs> that was when you kind of got to the end of it. And you just thought, oh. <laughs> um, he, he needs to seek out his local GP <laughs> immediately. <laughs> Help is at hand. It's, oh. There's... There's issues on top of issues with that one. <laughs> There's all sorts going on, but uh, what about you, Brian? You got anything for us? A Duncan Dare, a Duncan Dare, Jambos, Jambos, Jambos. Who can I think of? Um, 
I'd like to see big Uchi modelling scarves. <laughs> For any particular reason? He's just not got a neck, has he? No. I like, so, the, I like the randomness of daring big Uchi to model scarves. <laughs> well, it's just kind of, kind of out there, isn't it? See, one thing I could think of, just when you'd mentioned them earlier, getting hoisted up for a for a, for a throw, and I just, he, he was the only, the first jambo I could think of. And then my immediate first thought of him is, the he is the void of a neck. He's got the Sandy Talks figure about him. He has, you, aye. You well, thinking well, fashionable scarves are like World War One fighter pilot scarves? Just any type of scarf. I, I'm not sure how it would... I don't know how he'd be able to do it without a neck. It's the same way that I look at Louis Van Hal. I wonder if he would fold a tablecloth. Oh, aye, that's it. He couldn't have folded towels, eh? Aye, or put a pillowcase on, because he's got no chin. <laughs> okay, what, what, I like, what I like about your uh, Duncan Dares is, so this is how uh, our insight into math can mental heat, uh, is I imagine you've got right, all the Duncans lined up, and they're fighting to find out what their dares are. You got Gary Locke going, oh, fucking pissed on no again. Right? <laughs> he, he wanders off to get in his wee spot, and you've got McPhee going, oh, fucking, I've got the line out now. I didn't even like rugby. You, you, know, you wouldn't think it. And then he gets to the big Uchi, and he's going, oh, I'm a big target here. I'm a big fat mess. And, <laughs> but what am I going to get? Model scarves. What? Aye. <laughs> Aye. You can know it change your mind. No, nope. model scarves. Got it. And then running off. Thinking he's totally safe. Until he fucking tries it. <laughs> and then everybody's like, hey, look, you can look at Eddie Neck. <laughs> Tony looks in the mirror and goes, Aye. oh, oh nah, no, this, this is actually it's... trickier than what I thought. <laughs> it's gone wrong. Uh, ah, there you go. Uh, right, we've all had Duncan Dare, so we'll round up, actually, before we round up, quick look ahead to uh, the weekend's game against Kilmarnock. Uh, I made the mistake on Twitter saying, looking forward to the game on Saturday and somebody says oh but it's Kelly will get pumped and I went nah nah they're worse than us and then I checked the league table today the and they're above us so now oh, I feel like a dick Jesus it's oh. just gold difference though. it they is it's yeah they, they didn't ship six to Rangers no well I never saw it so it never happened as far as I'm concerned well, well, that's, that's maybe why I'm a wee bit that's easier going about things uh, what do we think is going to happen on Saturday? My, my tip is it's going to be the, uh, this, the game that changes our season. We're going to get a good result and it will kick on. So Heckingbottom will, either by accident or by design, stumble across the formula that works for the team. He's had a couple of weeks out of the limelight. Bit of the heat's off the players because of the international break. A bit of time to work on things. I, I, I saw your post on Hibs.net just before we, we started this podcast where you'd came out with words to a similar effect yep. and my first thought was he's had an ecky <laughs> <laughs> he's had an ecky <laughs> he's went here and he says to the wife I'm not going to bother I'm not hungry he's just went up the to the wee man cave <laughs> popped a Christian Benteke and just thought I'll go and have something it. I'm off <laughs> I would love to show your optimism but I once again the harbinger of doom we're going to get beat 2-0 Two nothing, eh? All right, well, up yours, uh, <laughs> <laughs> John. <coughs> John was it here? Oh, oh, hold on, you've turned into a Dalek momentarily. John's moved into an elephant. <laughs> Start again. You're on the taroid. <laughs> <laughs> We're fucking out who's doing the taroid Easter Road. <laughs> Sorry, John. Uh, oh. so, um, well. I'm a slow, I'm a slow ghost. Ah, we, I think you were getting there towards the end. So, if you if you just put pit, pit in another couple of double A's, <laughs> yeah, then you'll be all right. <laughs> you want to try again? Oh, I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Right. Uh, what were you saying? Uh, optimistic three 0 Hibs because I think they both are out every week, and at some point it's going to have to come in. I Aye. thought Stephen Hawking was dead. <laughs> <laughs> you ever seen the episode of The Simpsons where uh, Homer says, uh, I don't want to go to your voice? <laughs> <laughs> I should have been in The Simpsons a couple of times. Who, hey, Homer? Well, I was <laughs> saying. <laughs> <laughs> Aye, uh, what's his face, the professor? 
We always, okay. oh, aye, I can't, uh, I was about to give an insight and there was a time I remember a night in the pub with me and my mates were kind of, uh, this is an incredibly bad taste, so I, I apologise for, for this and, and I, but I'm going to I'm gonna go ahead with it anyway. We kind of thought about if he released an album and the songs that, that would that would be on it, uh, like Jump, Jump Around or uh, I Believe I Can Fly or uh, it's, it's terribly bad taste, isn't it? Like, I, I, I think I'm going to go to hell for that, and I'm sorry. I, I do apologise, sir. But I, I don't mean any disrespect to anybody with any of that. Walk this were, way. Walk this way, yeah. Um, <laughs> on the dance floor. <laughs> I, we should stop this now because there will be activists after us. Um, <laughs> I... I was, I was very young at the time. I was very, very drunk. It's not an excuse for these things, but I was very, very drunk. Um, okay, right. Well, th- this is a good time to move on to Snack of the Week, which will be the last of our features for uh, for this podcast. <coughs> uh, snack of the Week. Uh, who wants to start, John? Uh, well, I guess I'll start then. <laughs> Aye. Uh, cheese and pickle pork pies from Morrison's. What? Ah, these are uh, outstanding, by the way. That is a Aye. great shout. I've never even heard of them. Aye. Pork Bri- pie with Branson Pickle in it. Oh, Aye. baby. Uh, you need to go to the big Morrisons for them, though. They tend to have them in the smaller ones, so go to the bigger, at the supermarket. I think you get them in Tesco's as well. Oh, maybe. Maybe. I've only ever had the Morrisons ones. Aye. Uh, so if, if Mr. Morrison or Mr. Tesco's listening, you can send us some. We'll go plug them on the show. <laughs> See, this isn't fair. I'm featuring in. We've just got... We've just got... Uh, biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> We've just got takeaways and barber shops. We've not got Morrison's. Get yourself into the big ass, the jewel. We're just a town full of fat people with nice hair. <laughs> <laughs> Pork pies. I'll need to try them. I'm right. going to get a, I'm gonna have to venture into the big city. What are you having there for your snack of the week, Brian? You know what? I'm going to throw in a curveball. Angel slices. What? Oh, that's uh, an angel slice. What? Is that like a custard slice? Eh. Uh, kind of. Oh, oh. Nah. Angel slices. They're, they're, uh, they're. Oh, like sponge with pink icing. Um, Mr. Kipling ones. Oh, I know the ones. I know the ones. Aye. Aye. It's probably the sort of Dewey and Clary of uh, confectionery. <laughs> <laughs> There's a wee strap line for it. Eh? <laughs> you wouldn't want to be seen in public with him, but you would you would know shit in private. <laughs> he got uh, he got a famous one. It was like they were the TV awards back when they did the day this case stuff, and uh, he he came on stage and said he just peed at the back fist in Norman Lamont, <laughs> <laughs> and there was an uproar about it. Everybody oh, there lost was. their shit. And you, you think folk would say things like that now in the six o'clock news and get away with it? Aye. Uh, Trip of McDonald, and finally, <laughs> <laughs> guess what I've been doing? Um, <laughs> Did they announce it with a big bong? <laughs> <laughs> guess what I've been up to? Bong, bong. <laughs> bong. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, right, I'll, I'm going to struggle to top the pork pie with pickle because that is uh, that was one of the finest wee surprise treats that I had for, uh, for ages. Uh, chicken super noodles on toast. Oofed. Aye, you've got the dirtiness in the chicken super noodles because let's face it, nobody's proud of eating them, but everybody would admit they're good. And then you add in the wee, uh, the wee twist to the, uh, uh, some thickly buttered toast. It's an absolute it's, treat. <clears throat> is it uh, no? Is this a snack? That's, Aye, you'd, that's, you'd have that as some... a, like, for your supper, or that's, that's a, something I, I, I would cook a potential girlfriend that on a first date. <laughs> <laughs> if that's a snack, you've just blew it wide open now. Next week's going to be a cocker. Well, I've fallen foul of this before, but I, I suggested the, the Stevens Steak Bridey has been my snack of choice. And I, that was disqualified for being made at a lunch. Ah. But I would say, like, if you made yourself wee beans on toaster, maybe there's a bit of faffing about with it. So maybe I'm going to. Talk myself out of having it. No, it's immaterial anyway because the 
uh, the pork pie with pickles going to be my winner. Aye, I think it's aye. I think we have to give that one the crown. All right, we uh, partway through that we've lost John as well, which is a shame because we're just going to wrap up. Uh, I'm just going to try and invite him back onto the WhatsApp to say uh, to say thanks and to say cheerio and all that kind of stuff for the, the end of it. So in the meantime, what I'll do is just uh, while I'm waiting on him coming back on and join us, I'll thank everybody for listening. To thank you everybody for listening, I'll thank everybody who's followed us on Twitter because we're now nearly at 700 uh, Twitter followers. We sat. It's 666 for ages, and that worried me for a little bit. And then I remembered I'm not at all superstitious, so I kicked the shit out of a mirror. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we've got more followers, so they, they make it that what you will. So if uh, if you can follow us on Twitter, retweet us, and get other people to follow us, that helps us grow the podcast. But thank you to everybody who's following us already. We're also now on Instagram. Um, Brian, remember, uh, the, I sent you a wee screenshot of the boy that had asked us to come on the podcast. Yes. This is a funny. I just I'm going to tell the story. I don't name him because I, that's not fair. And I think he he was maybe about uh, a bit younger than us anyway. But we got a, a message from somebody I don't know who who followed the account and promptly uh, sent a one liner saying, "Can I come on the podcast with you? You spelt with a you and uh, down with the kids, down with the kids." And so I messaged him back and said, uh, "Go on, tell us a little bit about yourself, and uh, we'll see what we can do." So, uh, as I said, have you listened to the podcast as well? So you know what you're getting into. It. So he says, oh, I used to do a podcast myself. And he says, I've not listened to any yet. I said, well, that's fine. Go and have a listen to one. Make sure that it's something that you want to get involved with because we're a wee bit different. And uh, two minutes later, he, he said, just listen to episode nine. Loved it. And I said, episode nine was 54 minutes long. <laughs> and your comment, Brian, says, unless he's short circuit. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's not listening to that. All right, you're right. So that, that kind of... I thought, uh, we can't have that on the podcast. Uh, well, failing that, in the first two minutes, you probably would have cracked at least one or two of your, your, your staple jokes. So I, we would just listen to that and thought, that's the podcast for me. We're I know. Up. <laughs> but the thing with the staple jokes is they keep the whole show together. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Oh. Oh my word, nothing safe. Nothing safe. Nothing. <laughs> eh? There is there is no hope for anyone. And if the folk have made it this far as well, which is a credit to them, and then they get hit with that. Then Even John's fucked up. Ah, he's, he's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's not coming back and they'll think what, what have we done, John? <laughs> We're sorry. <laughs> it doesn't have to be this way. Um so. staring along and way Paul Hartley poster on his bedroom wall. <laughs> It should have been you. <laughs> it should have been you. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll give John a wee plug there anyway. So if, if you're on Twitter, follow at Colonel Chaos. He's down as Mr. Miyagi in there. But he also does alternate Hibs uh, Twitter. So uh, go give him a follow. Some very funny stuff in there. And loads of facts about uh, Brian Graham from what I, I can imagine. And, and who <laughs> who wouldn't want that? Um, oh, Brian, uh, is there anything else you want to cover before we wrap up? Oh, yeah. No, I think we've exhausted it all, haven't we? Aye, uh, that was the closest we got tonight to horse noise, by the way. You're right, it's, it's because of the lack of uh, a hip scheme. Uh, uh, actually, I, I probably even sound cheerier tonight <laughs> because I've not got a hip scheme to rage over. So I'd imagine normal service will be resumed on next Tuesday. The uh, horse noise will be back and I'll be back to my miserable best. And we'll record it next Tuesday. It feels like ages since we did it because we did it on Monday night last week. It feels like this has been a, lo- a long time since we recorded one. It does, actually, yeah. Especially yeah. when the Hibs game to cover. Um, OK, well, everybody wants to head down to Kilmarnock, get right behind the team, go and see the ladies on Wednesday and make it to the charity match on Sunday if you can. Thank you very much for listening. Please continue to do so, and uh, we will see you all next Tuesday. Cheers for now. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.